Welcome back to the Weekend Ball Podcast. My name is Alex Adams. I'm live here in Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, I've been covering Team Canada at the FIBA World Cup, and I am joined by Samson Folk of Raptors Republic. Everyone uh, at Raptors Republic knows Samson very well. He's also just uh, became uh, Jordy Fernandez's twin as we were recording. So uh, thanks so much, Samson, for, for coming on. We're both pretty jet lagged. So let's see how this podcast goes with uh, Canada obviously losing 95-86 to Serbia in a, in a pretty hard-fought game. Um, just, Samson, what are kind of your initial thoughts of, of the game uh, today? Yeah, our jet-lagged adult brains. O- oddly enough, both traveling to Ontario from the other side of the world, albeit for very different reasons, mm-hmm. my, my initial thoughts are that we really got to see Serbia flex the muscles of their roster construction, the continuity of their development through what they've been doing with the Serbian national team for some years, and really what aspects of basketball the FIBA game really allows you to flourish with, to enhance. And a lot of that is strength creation on the inside of, you know, on the interior. And Canada is a team that has done a fantastic job in this tournament with live ball creation from their guards, um, hot bursts of shooting and pace in transition, and really mucking up a lot of you know these international teams' favorite actions by liberal use of switching and doing so with their more finesse bigs and some of their grimy, gritty wing players who can kind of guard up, especially Dort, and Brooks, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, his cousin Shea, mm-hmm. uh, they did a pretty good job at the point of attack, but leaning on Dort and Brooks in particular to kind of guard up Barrett also. Uh, Serbia, as far as manipulating the game through the post, and really, you know, the, the post-entry stuff really broke the, the, the Canadian defense in this one. And their defense on the other side of things was good enough to keep Canada and the, the way that they managed the pace of play also meant that Canada couldn't bust out in transition to really run up the score or anything like that. And so at the end of it all, it was that Canada not having as much, you know, continuity in their program, not having the same level of FIBA bigs Mm -hmm. and sorry, Serbia really being able to kind of, you know, exacerbate some of the weaknesses that we've seen from Canada defensively until finally, Hey, you know, they lost it's tough game. They'll play for bronze. Regardless if they win or lose, it's their best finish at a World Cup ever. It's a big deal. Yeah, no, it's it's a huge deal. And uh, I mean, I, I thought just obviously you talk about continuity, but also maybe the lack of depth on this team. If you go sure. outside of the, the seven NBAers, right, with all the foul trouble. And maybe we'll talk about that later with FIBA officiating. But right, like Jordy did not want to go to his his more than, than seven, eight guys, right? And they play Trey Bell Haynes, they play Cal Alexander and that's what kind of led to Serbia's uh, 11-0 run. I think it was Canada was up 13-10 and then 21-13 uh, early in the first. And that was with basically the bench because Shea's in foul trouble, Brooks is in foul trouble, Powell's in foul trouble. And I thought that was really exacerbated in this game was just the lack of, of shooting, the lack of depth, and just, as you said, continuity, right? Like it felt as though Serbia always got a good shot no matter what. And for Canada... That wasn't really the case. And on, and on defense, really, maybe the lack of uh, a, a great big, like as good as Dwight Powell is, he's a bit undersized um, against Milan. I can't say his name, Milatunov is, I hope I said that right, um, <laughs> for, for Serbia. So uh, give them credit. They played amazing. Uh, I wish I, the game would have been maybe less of about kind of Canada starters versus Serbia because it really took them out of the game. Shea going off early. I believe he was, I'll double check, but he was almost an even plus minus uh, today, right? So if he's not in foul trouble, he was minus five. Um, and the guys like Nikhil and others were, were minus 22 and minus 11 for Lou Dort, who was mostly with Medj. So that was maybe kind of the game there, but uh, still really good run. And um, as disappointing as this is, um, it feels as though it's maybe the first step for this program finally breaking through to a semifinal. They can still win a bronze, and hopefully they do. But um, they, for me, this this tournament, after they, even today, I wasn't that upset because they got that Olympic berth, and that's yep. really what the goal of this program was. Now, if they were to win gold, great, awesome. I'm, I think we'd all be very excited. But 
at the same time, they, they got what they needed to do from this tournament and they're going to Paris and um, there's going to be a lot of interesting decisions on who's on that roster. And maybe that's something closer to, but um, still a great tournament, still something to play for. And um, maybe, as you said, the continuity and just the lack of experience really seemed to, to shine bright in, in this game against Serbia, who's, I think on the, I don't know what the, the right kind of way to describe it, but they've made it to, I think, three or four out of the last four semifinals and major tournaments, right? They won the silver medal in, in 2016 and um, obviously uh, have been just an amazing basketball country for so long. They're great. Um, it's a, not to wish cast too much, but for anybody who's listening, if you're wondering from the, the play style and analysis point of view, there are two things that will really help because there are no bigs in the pipeline who completely change the fabric of how this Canadian team will succeed, you know, in Paris. But Jamal Murray being in the backcourt, I think, provided there's no injury, I think is a certainty he will be with the team. He is one of the best just straight shot makers in the world. He's also, by proxy of playing next to Nikola Jokic, one of the best players as far as shot makers making off balance and you know off ball movement based shooting it's it's not just these rote possessions where he has to work into space it's he's a guy who in uncomfortable spots will hit hit, hit really high efficiency and that will pair extremely well along with Shea Gilgis Alexander and especially if they can pair them in two man actions together which we saw Serbia succeed in a bunch of two man actions especially the empty side stuff in this game and then additionally this one's more of a question mark, and some people will agree, some people won't. But Andrew Wiggins, if he's on Canada's team, the top locking that Canada was trying to do against mm. Serbia in this game that just didn't work at all, if Wiggins is fronting in that scenario, he's going to create much longer passes because of his length, his bouncy ability. He's also stronger and a little bit bigger. Longer passes gives the defense more time to catch up at the back end. It also allows them to plant under the big and then the, the length to double after that entry pass. Wiggins, for example, will make the passes out a lot more difficult. And if he's not covering it from that side, he's also a very capable weak side rim protector in a pinch. He can help out on the glass. Canada... They have some remedies to what happened here if you're going into the mm -hmm. future. They also have Andrew Nemhard, who I, I wanted him on the team, yeah. you know, this time around. He's still really underrated as far as his game at the NBA level. He's terrific. He's going to get much better. But also, I think he's a guy who can fit in in a pinch to what the what Canada wants to do at the FIBA level. There's good, there's better stuff coming, I believe. And that's not even to mention that, of course, again, Canada is going to play for the bronze medal in a World Cup. This is a fledgling program in some respects. It, it was so disappointing for a time that Steve Nash wouldn't play for them anymore. You know, now he's back in the fold. The NBA players are buying back in. Some of the loyalty guys over time who've been with the program forever helped them get to this point. Even though there's a loss against a, just a fantastic Serbian team, this is like this is a moment to celebrate for Canadian basketball, and it will be again. What I hope they win the bronze medal game, but whether they win or lose that one too, it should be good vibes for these guys. Yeah, no, uh, there's a lot to unpack there, but I think with just re with regards to how the team maybe shapes up in in, in Paris, like not only does you mentioned all the stuff that J Jamal. Murray does offensively in terms of creating his own shot and getting open, but he's a really good playmaker. I think in the first four games of the finals, he had what, 10 assists? I believe that's correct. I could be mistaken, but, um, and that was one of the things with this team is maybe the lack of shooting, which Jamal brings and the lack of playmaking and outside of Shea, it really felt it was hard to, to get kind of good looks through, um, you know, good, good playmakers, right. Other than maybe Nikhil here and there. And then he can he can also he's he's a big guard he's yeah. strong and he'll be able to switch through at the very least the first two but probably the first three positions on the floor defensively which fits Canada as well. He's, he's not a great defender, but he's not a Trey Young <laughs> minus defender, right? He's he, he no. can hold his own. Um, and and then with Wiggins, uh, he obviously brings another guy that can create his own shot, right? And on this team, other outside of Shea, there wasn't too many guys that could do that. And then he can shoot too, right? Again, this team felt as though they just didn't have the right shooting. And a lot of teams played zone against them and for the most part were pretty effective because guys like R.J. Barrett um, 
probably can't make a consistent outside shot. Same with Lou Dort. Dylan Brooks, I don't know. Dylan Brooks shooting, I am just – I will say being there in Jakarta, he was by far Canada's best shooter in practice. Now, practice is different than in-game, but it seemed to definitely translate uh, in this World Cup. So maybe that's something that is uh, more consistent. Maybe we see that in Houston. But um, if those two players are added, Andrew Nemhart as well, he uh, he played in 2019. He has a lot of FIBA experience, actually, even though he hasn't played for the program in a couple of years. Um, he'd be almost the perfect backup point guard. Um, and there's going to be other NBA guys knocking at the door, I'm sure. Um, it does suck that there is no real big coming out. I think Zach Eady maybe in five years would be really good for this team. I don't know if he's really ready yet even next year. Um, but uh, he's definitely an interesting option. Um, but overall, you, as, as annoying as this game was in a lot of ways, it felt like everything went wrong for Canada. Um, there's a lot to, for this team to grow. And most of the t- team is under 25 or 25, Shea, Nikhil, Dort, um, Brooks is, I think 27, but, um, a lot of young guys on the RJ, of course, 23, um, and they just got this immense amount of FIBA experience that Serbia's had for over many years. And, and yeah. Canada will gain that going into Paris. And um, they've learned a lot. They've learned how to win. They've learned maybe how to go through that adversity and, and lose a painful game like today. So um, the, the future is really bright. I think they should be a medal uh, contender in, in Paris, even with all maybe the, the, the lack of experience and stuff. And uh, I think we'll see somehow... Um, if maybe we'll, we'll the next couple of tournaments will always say Canada has a better roster than they've ever had before. Maybe that's the theme. Um, I'd yeah. imagine that's probably the case in Paris unless uh, injuries come to, to the forefront, which you never know. But uh, yeah. overall, yeah. The case is that for probably the next two Olympics, for the fan who's listening to this, for the fan who watched the games, the guys you liked watching, you're going to get to watch a lot of them for Team Canada over the next eight years and that includes olympics hopefully you know quarterfinals and up uh world cup quarterfinals and up and um less pesky qualification stuff because they're a much better ranked team and the program has um more momentum as far as uh rj barrett you touched on i do want to give rj barrett a little bit of love um he had a tough tournament the compressed fiba floor is a very tough thing for him to navigate. And he was asked to create against in in situations that he didn't do as well as Canada needed him to do. But also it really showed that Canada needs the ball to go elsewhere, but still RJ in a pinch kept trying. And I think volume scores, you know, they, they don't get a lot of love, but volume scores it's guys trying to create a reaction from the defense. And Shea Gilgis Alexander, as much as Canada is at their best when he's warming his way into spots and doing the impossible, collapsing a whole side of the floor, creating wide open three point shots, getting into the middle of the floor for these, you know, and one finishes, there the offense does need to come from other places. Yeah. And RJ, despite I think being not not only is his game not as complimentary for the FIBA level as it is at the NBA level, but not playing his best either, still continued to grind out possessions, not because it was what was like best for Canada and that's that's the approach that wins games, but because that's what had to have that's what had to happen. And it's box score watching. If you tune in at the end of this and you say, oh, RJ, you know, he led the team in scoring. He was 8 of 14, 3 of 8 from 3. I don't think that fully captures his offensive, you know, footprint. But I do think that, you know, compliments to RJ, despite having a tough tournament, still going out there and, you know, playing a lot of minutes for Canada and having some good runs here and there. He had a couple good runs in this game. Um you hope that he can slide more into a more complimentary role going forward. But what the program needed currently was a guy to apply pressure, at least in some form or fashion, that wasn't Shea. And RJ stepped up to do it. Uh, Dylan Brooks did it to close the game against Spain, and he did a wonderful job. It wasn't just the threes. It, he turned the corner and got to the rim, right? Um, it's a rotating cast for the most part around Shea as far as offensive process. 
and RJ took the wheel most of the time in that rotating cast in this game, even a great RJ game isn't saving Canada. Like the, the defense just couldn't get enough stops. So um, RJ, not his best tournament. He's gotten a lot of flack. I've bemoaned some of his decision making myself, but um, at the end of it all, it's tough to keep eating volume and possessions when you're not doing your best, but the team kept asking him to do so. It's so interesting because I remember I, t- I the first interview I had or like media scrum with him, I asked him about, because he had played so well in the friendlies. He was making all his threes. Uh, he had that 13 of 14 game against Germany. Hopefully that's the case in the, the bronze medal if they, they are to play Germany. <laughs> but uh, he said the paint's wide open in FIBA when I asked about the difference. And that doesn't really make sense because of the you know lack of defensive three seconds. Um, but I do think maybe in, in 2024, when there's more shooting on this roster, when it's Jamal Murray, um, Andrew Wiggins, just kind of spacing Team Canada, because it did feel as though the defense could just really collapse on him, um, especially with maybe Lou Dort out there and, and others. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that translates. But I think what you mentioned about the, you yeah. know, him being a, a scorer, uh, first, and he he had a pretty up and down tournament, and even today the box score makes it look much better than I think he he played today. But um, that's that's something. But he's still really young. He's the youngest player on the roster, I believe. So um, definitely room to improve. And it's never really felt he's had a great roster around him for Canada in this tournament, especially with the Knicks when they have literally just Randall and Mitchell Robinson uh, mucking up the the paint. So. Yeah, I think he'd be better with a lot of spacing. And it felt as though that was the case when they played five out with a Linux out. He played his best. Um, but uh, that's someone, maybe someone else I, I want to touch on because Olenek had an amazing three first games and he really seemed to sputter at the end of this tournament. And I don't really know why. I thought his defense was really up and down. He just let guys blow by him a lot where it felt like, I don't know if he should be as much as he's not a defensive ace. Um, maybe a lack of effort a little bit. I don't want to say that too harshly, but it just felt as though he was um, just not at his best down the stretch. And they really needed that from him in this tournament. And he he really uh, did not step up when it, it mattered most in this tournament. I think that's RJ couldn't have swung this game, but a great Kelly game pro- probably could have. Um, as far as like Kelly, you know, he shoots one for six. He had some foul grifting where he found his way to the line that kept them afloat a little bit. Um, But for the most part, you know, you talked about the first three games. Kelly did a fantastic job of inputting himself into the offense, being a release valve as far as like a guy who can help change the, you know, the complexion of the defense and how they shape up to other players, hitting shots over top of it, be it zone or a flare or just that, you know, he's the guy next over shaping up off of somebody else, hitting a three. And then also with these FIBA bigs, if they're stepping out on a guy like that, Kelly, we see it all the time at the NBA level, putting a dribble down and getting to a more dangerous spot on the floor. If help comes, he is at the NBA level and has shown at the FIBA level an advanced passer for his position and size, especially when we talk about on the move. Um, he, he doesn't he doesn't pass or play make like a lot of FIBA bigs do. But in motion, he does a pretty damn good job. And it's just he wasn't very dynamic. And a dynamic big, if you're not going to, you know, initiate through a big at the FIBA level, you need a dynamic big to get a big out in space mm-hmm. and dominate them. If that's the that's the solve. That's how you make it happen. And we've seen USA does that because they have the big sometimes despite not playing classic FIBA style basketball like Serbia beat Canada with. And so that was disappointing as far as like the defense. Yeah. Um, Kelly with the, the big games that Brazil, Spain, you know, Slovenia didn't matter as much because it was a comfortable win a couple times. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then this game, you could tell um, the defense uh, suffers when he's out there. Guys are turning the corner on him. He's, you know, arguably the biggest body out there for Canada, but he can't really have a massive effect on the glass. They have their best defensive runs without him on the court. And for all that he brings, and he has like a huge pool of talent sitting there, especially for a front court player, you have to be able to input that talent into the game. This is what a lot of players struggle with adjusting to new rules, new dimensions and stuff like that. But uh, he found it for some games. 
found it in pockets of games, but down the stretch of this Canadian run, he didn't find it often enough. And unfortunately, uh, not in this game, their penultimate game. I, I want to sing the praise of a little bit of Dwight Powell because I actually thought mm-hmm. really throughout the tournament he got better and better. People might malign his missed layup today, but I thought he got fouled. Um, but I thought his defense was really good, and obviously he, he got in foul trouble a lot. I don't know how much of that was always his fault necessarily. It didn't feel like he was whacking guys or out of he, position. He's just asked to do a lot from the big yeah. man position on the yeah. perimeter. You're going to foul. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I just thought he was really good and, and really was a good presence. I thought his finishing around the rim was pretty good throughout the tournament, um, and it felt as though Canada – played its best with him, um, especially down like as the tournament kind of progressed without Kelly, but with him on the court providing that defense and um, pretty, he made some pretty acrobatic finishes around the rim against Spain. He did um, a couple against uh, Slovenia as well. So um, he was pretty emotional when they, when they made the Olympics, I, I was there um, and I, I asked him right after they won and he, he was, I don't know if he was teary eyed necessarily, but you could tell it, it hit him. And it's really cool to see him just be now going to be an Olympian next year, barring a major injury. And uh, I just want to sing his praises because he was there in 15, like Olenek. He was there in 21 um, and and really been through the ringer as someone that's always really shown up for Canada when it mattered and, and had all the heartbreak, uh, as, as unlike many of the other young players on this team. So... Um, I thought he was great, and it really felt as though maybe Canada needs another big rather than necessarily Powell mm-hmm. stepping up to the plate. I, I like Kyle Alexander, but he's just not good enough offensively. Um, and even Powell's a pretty good passer kind of down low as well. Like He's not just a kind of a schlub. Um, so I, I really want to sing his praises. And, and as well, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, other than the Brazil game, I thought he played really well today. Yeah. He made his shots, had a couple turnovers, and, and got in foul trouble like literally everyone else on this team today. But he played really well. And I think in a FIBA game, he really stood out. And if if Canada, when Canada goes to Paris and maybe there's a bit more shot uh, kind of shooting around him and, and more playmaking, I think it'll really bring out the best of him because he shot pretty well throughout this tournament. Um, and uh, I really liked his game other than the, the Brazil game where he shot the ball off the backboard and air yeah. ball open threes. What you mentioned about Dwight, he's a guy who's fought injury in his career. He's a guy who plays spread pick and roll in Dallas for years and, you know, is asked to be like a spacey finesse big. And then when he comes and plays for Canada, it's like you got to grind game in and game out and you got to provide a lot of physicality. And so while that's not, not the natural, you know, that's not the natural flourish of his game, he finds a way to kind of impact and do things. And as you said, He's a guy who's been with the program for a long time, has given himself to it. And I thought, you know, as you say, it's not really, um, it's not about finding, you know, a guy to replace Dwight Powell. Dwight Powell can be one of the three best big men on a world championship team. Certainly he can. And uh, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, the shooting, hell yeah. I hope that sticks around in Minnesota. But as you mentioned, the defense, really, it's so important for a team like Canada that they really want to push teams into the back end of the shot clock so they can swarm. Sure. And in that way, they don't have to fight bigs as much. And Nikhil jumping up on, on screens, kind of rerouting guys to the sidelines, moving teams into the back of shot clocks, did a fantastic job at the point of attack. I thought he competed like hell. He's really fun tournament for him. I just keep thinking with Nikhil about his on-ball defense against Spain, just those last five minutes where he made that big shot in the corner to get, I think, 78-74. Wow, I think yep. I got that right. Um, and just the way he swarmed Nunez, the 19-year-old point guard for um, Spain, and they really had to, Spain down the stretch, had a lot of shots at the buzzer at the end of a shot clock because of how much uh, Nikhil really swarmed uh, the the point guard for Spain and, and others. So I really liked his tournament um, and uh, it'll be exciting to see him and, and, and Shay as Olympians and cousins. I think that'll be a pretty cool for the family. Obviously Shay's mom, for people that don't know was an Olympian as well. Um, so it's definitely all in the family of an Olympians now. So that's pretty cool. And actually uh, uh, Kyle Alexander and, and Kayla Alexander, I forgot about that. So if Kyle makes it to the Olympics, that'll be interesting. But yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see how they, 
go into Paris and I think the big man position and then really who they have in the front court in terms of is it Kyle Alexander is there someone else they find out of the wilderness we'll see um, mm-hmm. but that's maybe a, a question really for this team because it feels as though guards and wings they're more than set for the next eight ten years like the next couple yep. of it's more just can they find that big and the U.S. is finding that problem as well they don't really have those bigs coming up unlike a lot of uh, other countries. The FIBA bigs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Like Jaron Jackson Jr., his type of offensive creation, he can do really well in the NBA level, but in FIBA, he just, it's tough. Also, um, he just fouls at a rate of <laughs> astro- astronomical, so that yeah. that does not help him. And he does that in the NBA too, to be fair. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All all defensive player of the years do, for what it's worth. Does Draymond Green have a high foul rate? Um. Yeah, well, he does foul quite a bit, yeah. but it's because you're active, right? Like there's a collinearity, especially early on in um, your career, like Rudy Gobert and Jaron Jackson Jr. When they started, they just foul the hell out of guys all the time. You know, it's, that's, maybe, that was, that's what happens. Maybe that's what's the case with Canada. It's just you're, they're new to FIBA, so the refs just call everything. That, 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 that's maybe that's why. But uh, um, Oh, yeah, we didn't do the, the ref talk. Um, yeah. Tough whistle. Some ticky-tack stuff for sure. Yeah, I mean... It just that Canada was up thirteen ten, and I keep thinking about that. And then Shea gets a ticky tack foul, um, Brooks as well, and they just go on this run. And, and Canada really could never come back from that. Now they had their chances, especially in that third quarter to start the third quarter. They had just they finally felt that their defense locked in. They got a couple stops, and they just made bad offensive decisions. And Brooks took a bad shot. Shea took a bad shot. Kelly had the whole lane open, didn't know what to do, and just threw it up but they weren't uh, perfect in transition and yeah. they had to be perfect in transition exactly. you gotta be you yeah. gotta be um but with the refs um i mean they they got a it i don't even know i think it's, they were just bad and canada got the, the the tough whistle tonight more so than serbia um i didn't feel as though if anything serbia felt more aggressive defensively than than canada so it was really weird that canada serbia was- stronger without moving their feet like that's that's the big thing, right? Is Serbia is a more strength based team, and they they have slower footed guys. So a lot of the fouls for that Canada was getting called on is like being overwhelmed by physicality on the spot, and those fouls are really easy to call for refs. Whereas Canada, with their you know their on ball motion, their live ball creation, this is like try refing Shea Gillis Alexander. Yeah. He, he's moving very quickly. There's a lot of limbs going, and there's a guy trying to catch up. I think Shea had a, you know, even though he went to the free throw line a bunch in this yeah. tournament, I think he had a tough whistle. A yeah. lot of hands are in that chest. He he wore a lot of seat belts. You know, yeah. he's a very safe driver, as yeah. it were. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's just easier to ref the, like, slower plotting stuff than it is mm-hmm. the, the live ball dribble stuff. And, and, and Canada, and- unfortunately, yeah. And I think with Serbia, they they have all that FIBA experience. They maybe know how to get the refs, maybe not on, on their sure. side, but just the 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 know how of how to kind of navigate FIBA officiating for Canada. It's a bit harder. And um, I just think about the fouls Brooks took today, where it's like I don't even. He's just battling. It wasn't um, anything else. And there's a shot on Bogdanovic in the fourth quarter when Canada was making that run, and they had to take Brooks out, and and it really felt as yeah. though that swayed the momentum there was a lot of times where canada had to sub out guys because of foul trouble um and i'm not saying the refs yeah i'll just i'll just say though serbia was the better team they yeah were. yeah they they're, were. they're a great program great team yeah. no they were amazing and um i don't think the refs lost canada the game but i do yeah. feel as though um they took canada out of the game i think in a lot of ways in terms of especially in that first quarter where it felt the teams were pretty even and then canada had to blow it kind of take off um, a lot of their guys. The thing is, though, is Serbia had a much deeper bench than Canada, right? And I, I think that's something that going to Paris, hopefully we'll see a better, a deeper team. And where if Canada is in foul trouble early, they can go to guys off the bench, um, Fernandez or whoever the coach is, if he has an NBA job by that time, um, can can rely on, on the bench more so um, than, than this team where he was just really reluctant to play anyone other than the seven NBA players more than um, two minutes. Yep. Well, 
um i'm assuming you have to go right away you'll have stuff about prepping people you'll have you'll have coverage prepping people for the bronze medal game alex yeah, for sure thanks I'm... for having me on man yeah no thanks so much uh jordy fernandez's twin for for coming on i appreciate it and uh yeah, I think we're both jet lagged, so I hope people enjoyed this. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel too bad right now. But uh, thanks again, everyone, and uh, I'll definitely have something up tomorrow to, to prep whoever Canada plays. We'll find that out in the next couple hours in the bronze medal game. And that'll be uh, – I hope people stay up for 4.30. I know I am. Um, somehow FIBA made it an earlier game by 15 minutes, so that's, that's how it works, right? Uh, but, uh, Samson, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and, and bearing with your, your jet lag. And uh, – Thanks again for doing this. Really proud of your work, man, in this Thank tournament. You. It's been awesome. Thanks so much, Samson. I appreciate that.